Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Alex from Catalysis. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Joris from Digital Science. Um, first of all, it's nice to speak to a crowd that is very positive about blockchain for a change. Um, so that's a good starter. Um, we go to the first slide. So we want to talk about uh, our uh, uh, blockchain for peer review initiative. It's an uh, initiative we started uh, about half a year ago, I think a bit longer, a bit more, yeah, together with Catalysis, together with Springer Nature, um, Taylor and Francis, um, Cambridge University Press and Digital Science. Um, and we want to talk today about progress, about where we are, what we aim to do with the initiative and also about lessons learned. Um, but I want to start uh, with uh, some general uh, observations about uh, blockchain for science and I think where we are uh, at in uh, our efforts. Um, and for me it's, it's a good moment because last year, November, we published the blockchain for research uh, report. Uh, and it's really amazing to see uh, how much progress uh, there is in the last year. Um, I think the first mentions of, of blockchain and uh, uh, the, the application to, to research and scholarly communication was a few years ago. It started with some blog posts. Um, I think 2017 was really the year of ideas. Um, of course, uh, Sunke was uh, instrumental, very important that with his uh, uh, open documents. Um, and I think it's an indication of the, you know, uh, your leadership that uh, many of the ideas that you uh, actually suggested and proposed with your group uh, are actually uh, being realized at the moment. Um, so 2018 was really uh, the idea at uh, the year of, of uh, concrete applications. So uh, I haven't uh, counted them, but I think we are uh, in the dozens of applications. It's really encouraging. Um, at the same time, uh, I think we're going to the next phase. Um, which is, uh, and, and the, the former speaker Ava talked about it, is making sure it's actually used. And I think that might be even more challenging than uh, thinking about it and building an application. So how can we move uh, the ecosystem, how can we move researchers, et cetera, to use the blockchain? Um, I think Albert Einstein said that uh, politics is more uh, difficult than physics, and I think it's also uh, the case for, uh, for, uh, for computer science. So the, the big challenge really is going to be how can we make sure that uh, this is going to be widely adopted in the industry. And I think there, there are a couple of things that are going to be crucial in that. Um, uh, first of all, of course, science and research didn't start yesterday. It's, uh, it's, it's something that is hundreds of years old. And with that, history becomes, comes legacy, uh, not only in technology, but also in processes, in, in culture, in expectations. Uh, and we have to also think about how to change that. So what is going to be the catalyst for us. So what is going to move the ecosystem to a new way of working? Is it going to be a government? Is it going to be funding? Or is it going to be researchers themselves? Uh, I think that's a very important question we have to answer. Um, if it's about researcher, um, I actually uh, liked your presentation very much. Um, uh, I think it's very important to, to make sure that they are on board. And of course, everybody's worried about uh, openness, about transparency about uh, the metrics that are limited. But at the same time, of course, the short-term goal of researchers is reputation. And uh, I think it's indeed, uh, it might be surprising on the first, uh, the, the first hand that young researchers are not open to new tools, but I think it's very logical if you think about that they have to build their career. So they have to build their publications and citations. So it's very important that we address the reputation uh, aspect uh, in, in uh, blockchain. Um, the last remark I want to make is about open science. Uh, I think it's a no-brainer that science has to be more open, more transparent. I hear an echo. Is that just me? Do you still hear me? Um, at the same, let me put it a bit further. At the same time, uh, open science means different things, and we have to think, differentiate them, and, and really think about what to focus here. Uh, open science means sometimes not commercial, so getting the commercial uh, companies out of the uh, ecosystem. Um, it can also mean um, open access, which is, of course, a separate uh, thing. I mean, open access doesn't mean that the commercial companies are not going to be involved anymore. So what are we focusing on? Uh, at the same time, uh, open access as a model also has its disadvantages, of course. I mean, we've, I've been around in this industry for 20 years. The first talks about open access started 20 years ago, and we're still about 30% of the articles uh, that are open access. Now, there are many reasons for that, but um, with open access also came some disadvantages. Uh, predatory publishing, for example. 
or the, the challenges for researchers from the global south that get published. Um, and I think we should be open actually to alternatives because the blockchain actually offers an alternative, that's micropayments. So let's also see whether that might be a more sustainable uh, business model for the future. Um, open science also means open data, of course, and I think there, especially uh, with blockchain, we have huge opportunities with uh, tokenization and uh, ensuring intellectual property. Um, and sometimes it's also uh, used in open peer review, and I think that's actually yet another uh, topic uh, because the reason, of course, there is single blind and double blind models is not, it's not because of commercial interests, it's because, of course, confidentiality and ensuring that, that researchers are, feel free to, to give a candid feedback on articles. So without any, giving any recommendation, I think it's important that we distinguish those, those experts of open, open science. So let's talk about our initiative. Um, uh, what we try to do with our initiative is solve uh, one uh, uh, challenging aspect of uh, scholarly communication at the moment and that's peer review. Um, and there are actually many challenges. Um, first of all, uh, peer review is not recognized the way it should be. Um, again, researchers are mostly valued or assessed uh, by a number of publications, citations, but there are activities that are equally important and peer review, of course, is a very important one there. And yes, there are efforts, definitely. There's Publons, uh, there's ORCID, of course, but still it's not uh, as recognized as other activities are. Um, there's an increasing difficulty to find suitable reviewers. Uh, there are more and more publications. There are more and more publications from China. And they're making uh, you know, big developments in terms of publication, but they're not participating in the review process as much um, yet. So that puts a lot of strains on the existing reviewer pool. Um, unfortunately, there are cases of fraud, manipulation, leading to retraction, and uh, basically the peer review process is just simply too much of a black box. I think John Tennant said once, we have to open the black box of peer review, and I think exactly that's what we need. We have to be more open, more transparent, and, 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 and show more about what the process entails. Um, because again, it leads to a lack of transparency and it's, uh, a lack of trust in science. And again, if you look at the problems around irreducibility, and, and fraud and, and manipulation, it's really something we have to work on. Then the question is, of course, what do we do about it? Um, so what our mission is, what we feel, is that if we allow all the participants in the ecosystem to share peer review information, uh, that's gonna make, that's gonna solve um, many of the problems I talked uh, about. For example, when you talk about finding a reviewer, uh, publishers are now more or less dependent on their own uh, database of of reviewers. But of course, if you consider to select a reviewer for the review process, it's very good to know that, that the reviewer also did uh, reviews for comparable journals at other publishers. It's also great to know that, hey, that reviewer, I might invite him or her, but uh, he, he or she is actually involved in another peer review process at the moment. So it might not be wise to invite uh, the reviewer at the moment. So we can coordinate the review process and make it more efficient by starting to share the information. Uh, recognition also, of course, starts with having the data. Uh, if you don't know what the review process, uh, who re reviewed what, you can't recognize them. So if we collect on a structural way information about review, inf uh, review process and the reviewers, we can also properly recognize them. Um, and of course, uh, transparency. We have predatory publishers. We have review process which are not uh, entirely incorrect. If we store information, again, the metadata about the review process, we create an auditable trail so that we, in case of questions, in case of concerns, we can always go back to the blockchain and show actually the review took place or didn't take place. So that really adds uh, to the transparency aspect of the, uh, of the peer review process. Um, very important aspect, um, we are uh, uh, building a, a private blockchain uh, within the ecosystem, so all the participants uh, in uh, peer review, um, we invite to join us. Um, so we have the purposes I mentioned already. We have ORCID, uh, which, uh, which joined as well. And also important, the funders. Because the review process for journals is now more or less separated from the review process from the, from the funders, equally important. But of course, there's a big overlap between uh, those that review papers and those that review funds. So also combining that information will make the process uh, more efficient and more transparent. Um, 
So what did we do exactly and where we are? Um, we are now, uh, we built our proof of concept, which we delivered in September according to planning, which is uh, remarkable. Um, uh, um, and um, in a proof of concept, we're testing three things uh, within the, the range of possibilities to validate the process so that we, using the blockchain, can independently validate the review process so we don't have to rely on the publisher itself. Um, recognition, concretely, uh, whenever a, a reviewer um, uh, performs a peer review for the journals that are connected to the system, information about that is automatically sent to ORCID, so that adds to the recognition aspect, and search. So already starting to, uh, to, to use the system to make searching, finding, uh, selecting the right, right reviewer, uh, combining the information from, 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 from multiple journals and multiple publishers uh, more efficient. And for the more technical details, I'll give the word to Alex. Thanks, Joris, for this intro. Um, so, um, I'm from Catalysis. Catalysis is extremely young in this industry, only one year. Uh, so we have a very fresh view, uh, maybe a bit naive. Um, but what we um, would like to do uh, as a company is to democratize the value of online content. Um, and to do that, we leverage blockchain technology. Um, so our vision, and it's not actually uh, contained to uh, academia, it's more broad in terms of publishing, is really to tie together the th what we see as the three uh, actors, uh, the three main actors in this, uh, in, 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 in this, this world of uh, creating and consuming uh, digital contents. Uh, so we have contributors um, who um, are interested in having their work attributed to them, uh, compensated as well. Um, you have consumers who want relevant content, uh, of course, and they want it to be available uh, easily, they want it to be of a decent quality, and they want it at a fair price. And um, you also have people who check the quality of the content, um, so reviewers. So we believe that they seek appreciation, uh, sometimes compensation, um, and also being able to comment uh, truly uh, rather than just want to make sure that um, they, they commented. So they want safety and being able to, be, um, to, 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 to give their comments. So that's how we view how eventually the landscape should be. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, so we're a tech company, uh, so we build on top of uh, a blockchain implementation uh, using an Ethereum virtual machine, um, and we build various modules um, that basically provide specific functionality. So for instance, we have a micropayment module, which allows you to get money from the uh, existing banking system, so no cryptocurrencies, uh, in and out. Uh, we have ways to identify content uniquely and register ownership, and various other modules that you can then sort of uh, tie together into a proper solution. So right now we have two solutions. We have a micropayment solutions. So for instance, should you have a blog and should you have loads of friends or fans who are willing to pay for what you write, uh, we provide a WordPress plugin that allows you to effectively provide um, payments for your blogs. But that's more the commercial publishing space. In the peer review space, we basically take some of these uh, modules and um, put them together to build what I will be uh, discussing a bit more in a minute. Um, so to do this, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We don't reinvent everything. We do not build our own blockchain. Uh, there's just not enough time for this. So our starting point is uh, the ethereal virtual machine, which is in the middle. However, we do not necessarily uh, want to be tied to a lot of other great projects that are pushed on the blockchain. Therefore, we use a great blockchain technology, a Tendermint, which for those of you who were there yesterday have heard a lot about. Um, so we use this as our consensus engine, and it exposes to us an Ethereum virtual machine. And uh, all of our top layer stack is Swift, which is uh, a very nice language. Um, so, then what do we do with it? Um, so we build our own libraries on top of uh, the EVM. So we have a number of smart contracts which we interact with uh, using libraries that we've built 
And because the libraries end up being in, um, in a server-side environment, we also have access to uh, traditional technologies such as databases, uh, payments uh, systems. We can inter interface with uh, mobile clients, web applications, uh, you name it. Um, the interesting aspect of using the EVM um, is that uh, we're not tied just to uh, Tendermint as a consensus engine, so we can actually uh, replace that bottom layer by a number of other blockchain implementations. So of course, there's Ethereum, uh, there's Quorum from JP Morgan, um, there's Burrow from Monax, um, and uh, yeah, and we use Ethermint. Um, so uh, let's go a bit deeper in how we build this. Um, so we provide um, a parser which extracts information from uh, manuscript management systems, uh, so which are basically where the reviews are done. We process this data by chopping it up into various uh, categories, the three categories that would, uh, I will uh, go over uh, in the next slide. And we push some of that data in the blockchain. We push some of that data to ORCIDs, which, uh, interestingly enough, helps a researcher to start to uh, um, to annotate their profiles with information that can be verified on a blockchain. So yesterday, uh, Rob uh, had a question around, oh, what if I have 20 different profiles? Then the thing is, once you start to accumulate information that pertains to your profile in one profile, effectively, it's not in your best interest to start to have 20 profiles because you don't link the profiles. So we start to give more value to a profile. Um, and um, the way ORCID is done, of course, is not just us that can add value, other parties can add value, and then you can have a complete profile, which is more interesting. Um, on the top, we have a peer review query system. So that's, that's an interesting part, because that's the, that's the part that allows us to open up uh, the data that you may not want to store on the blockchain uh, to external parties. Um, and this process resides very close to where the data is stored, which means that as a commercial party, for instance, you're able to selectively grant access to data that you have within your company uh, based on very sort of uh, sophisticated permissioning systems which are uh, stored on the blockchain, um, which means that um, you can use the best of both, both worlds, as in you can share some data on the blockchain, but the things which you feel shouldn't be shared just publicly, you're also able to share it and control access to it. So taking a step back, how do we partition the data? So functionally, we have three types of data. We have public data, which we're okay, and uh, parties who want to work with our technology are okay to share publicly. So it's data that uh, you should assume that you give it away. Um, no one will, or everyone will be able to access it forever. It's a blockchain after all. Um, for us, that means relationship between entities. So for instance, relationship between a, an anonymized ID, which represents a reviewer, for instance, and a manuscript. Uh, it represents the state in which a review is. So for instance, if I've been invited to review a paper, um, it, it stores when I've been invited. It stores when I come back with my review. It doesn't store the review itself. However, it, store, it, it stores potentially ways to go back into um, the review information. So the second one is personal information. So of course, we will never store any uh, data which can identify me or any reviewer on the blockchain because then it's there forever. Um, and then we have a problem with the uh, European authorities around GDPR. Um, we store information that allows um, people to claim that they are part of a relationship. Um, and then the last one is competitive information. So that's how I explained that our query engine allows uh, you to expose data externally without giving away the control. Uh, so effectively, how this translates is that the blockchain stores references um, which are uh, protected using a permission system back to internal systems. So the data flow. Um, 
high level, the publisher provides us with data. Um, so in this slide, we've mostly extracted um, the, the high level data that we store to, uh, as an example. Um, so what we get is a manuscript which is tied to a reviewer um, and which has a specific review state. We process it first so that we extract the information that allows us to identify people uniquely. And um, we have a mechanism whereby we can then hand over to an ORCID profile, for instance. And if people do not have an ORCID profile or do not want to take ownership of this information, that's also OK. But it means that the data that we will store in the blockchain is basically useless for anyone forever. Um, and um, the, the, we annotate the data that then goes in the blockchain with this um, unique identifier. Um, so we design this unique identifier such that um, it's not possible. So let's say if you review for two different manuscripts, you will have two different unique identifiers. So that you cannot sort of try to do some statistical analysis uh, on who has done what and come up with the identity of the person. So what I've described is basically a node uh, in our blockchain system. Uh, so how would it work then? Um, then it's really multiple participants who are able to um, give access to their internal data uh, to other participants. So the way we started, um, we're, we're working with Spring and Nature, Taylor and Francis, uh, Cambridge University Press, Cargo joined recently, um, and we're feeding our data to ORCIDs. And really the blockchain is this, uh, th this, um, th this connector in the middle which allows the information to flow between all the parties, but also to aggregate the information of all the parties. So then I've added a question mark, which is anyone else who would be interested to, con to add more data to the system. Um, the little people on the sides are basically also the fact that while we do currently use a, um, a private blockchain, it's mostly because at the end of the day, blockchain is a very, very young technology. And uh, yesterday we talked about how actually it's difficult to provide a system that is perfect uh, day one, which means that you do not need to perform any upgrades or this and that. And we realize that we're not at the stage where we can say there will never be any upgrades. So we want to, at least for the next couple of months, keep enough control of that system so that we can s go through multiple upgrade cycles and at one point be able to say with confidence, okay, we open it up and people can start to use it. Um, and we're also aiming eventually to provide an API so that people can add more services on top of it. So now I'm gonna go through an example um, of what you could do with this. Uh, as Joris said, in September, we completed uh, the first part of the proof of concept, which is mostly a backend system, um, but there's no UIs. And without UIs, uh, no one's ever gonna use it. Um, so the next step for us is to start to implement um, uh, let's say user interfaces which will make it extremely easy and obvious as to what the benefits of such a system is. So let me take you through an example uh, now. Um, so let's say um, a publisher uh, through their own internal uh, systems have a certain view on a reviewer. Uh, so they can see that this uh, professor Aldous uh, Dumbledore has done a number of reviews for them but it looks like this guy is actually not really interested in doing any reviews. Uh, if you look at some of the statistics, for instance, you see that the acceptance rate is relatively low um, and that most reviews are not delivered uh, within expected times. Uh, you have no clue whether the guy is available or not um, and you don't know if he's engaged in any other reviews than your own because effectively you have your own view. Now, you go to another uh, publisher, for instance, um, it's the same thing, they have their own view. And for this one, actually, this guy is actually top notch, right? Uh, he's really delivering things on time, um, and all the time he accepts uh, a review, and um, yeah, they're very happy with him. A third publisher, uh, has yet a different view. And the, the, the pattern I'm, I'm starting to expose there is that the, the access, we basically have, every party has access to part of the data. And what we aim to do with this blockchain is to 
allow people to share some of the data so that instead of doing statistics on a subgroup, you can start to do statistics on a bigger uh, group. So when we tie all this information together, what you could get to is actually a much better picture of what reality is. So that's quite interesting. Now, what if we expose this to third parties or more people who have access to this information and who can also add some more information on that blockchain? For instance, what if this professor actually is extremely willing to state that not only right now they have nothing to do, so they're available for reviews, but also they're going to go on holiday in a couple of, uh, oh, they've gone on holiday already, um, and they are on holiday also now, but what if you could also push that information on the system? Then, effectively, you can start seeing that you can continue to enhance the information and take this even further because you can give an even better view of what uh, your current availability is. So that's one example of what could be done with such a system. And the back end is, is there, so we're seeding it with data uh, more or less as we speak. Um, and we're hoping to work on the UI sides uh, in the next couple of months. And now I'll hand it over to Juris. Yeah, thank you. The last couple of slides. Um, maybe something about the, uh, the planning. Uh, so again, it's very early days. We are uh, more or less half year down the road. But um, yeah, th this of course will be successful if all uh, participants in the ecosystem contribute. If all journals basically uh, um, share their data uh, and funders and institutions, for example, start to use the data as well. So uh, when we tested the proof of concept, um, then uh, it would definitely for next year we will add more participants. Uh, we go to the, the MVP uh, somewhere planned for the summer for 2019 and now we're discussing with the participants you know, what kind of functionality we'd like to see in there. And of course, indeed, it's going to be a mixture of making sure we have a robust backend, but also uh, showing functionality that really triggers uh, publishers, editors, but also researchers, again, to, get, uh, to ensure that the, the adoption is high. Um, but again, this is all still uh, uh, something that has to be decided. Uh, I want to end with some uh, lessons learned. Um, um, uh, a couple of, of, of things that, that really uh, surprised us, or uh, positive or negative. Uh, one is, um, uh, Einstein said, uh, um, uh, politics is more difficult than, uh, than, uh, than physics, but uh, 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 legal is even more difficult, uh, especially, of course, because of the GDPR uh, implementation. Uh, legal teams are extremely cautious, and of course, we understand that. Uh, the complexity here, of course, is that we're talking about blockchain, it's a new technology. So, um, yeah, really the delays we suffered are really partly due because of uh, legal consideration, GDPR, and explaining um, what it entails and taking away the worries is really taking a lot of our, uh, a lot of our efforts. Uh, the second is managing the hype. Um, the hype can be a good thing uh, because it means people talk about it. Uh, but it can also mean uh, a negative thing. It can that people, for example, uh, are interested for the wrong reasons or they, they don't really understand what, what, what it is. So it's really uh, make finding the balance of using the hype uh, and sometimes steering away from it, for example, by you know, stressing the advantages for the reviewers and the authors and not, not even talking about blockchain sometimes. Sometimes that just simply helps. And the third is, again, tied to that, uh, yes, is patience and education. Uh, we are in an extremely uh, early phase, uh, again, only uh, the last couple of years, and we should be really patient. We should not, uh, I think, expect big changes next year or even the year after, but we should really steadily work towards improving the ecosystem in various ways um, with, I think, the long term in mind, uh, because if we rush too much, uh, people might be disappointed and the hype can really work against us. So with that, uh, I would like to end. Um, Thank you very much, and uh, welcome any questions. So there's uh, one question right next to me, and the others who uh, have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll come and get, um, bring the microphone. Uh, thanks for the nice talk, very nice uh, concept and idea. Um, I would like to go a little back to the, to the initial part that you said, that you have kind of all planning to have a non-profit organizations running this and I think governance and um, the concept behind this would be very interesting because 
you know, we, 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 as a scientific community, we had the issue that we basically are relying too much on, on commercial entities and are kind of locked in this. And f from this perspective, I really like that you are going for, for non-profit. Um, what, is, what is the aim? Um, how, how can people participate in there and how is this governed, actually? This would be my, my key questions here. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, very, uh, a very good question. Um, uh, you have scientists complaining about, uh, I don't want to have yet another system I have to work with. And equally, you have publishers that, that say, I don't want to have another non-for-profit non body that I have to work with. Um, uh, the good news is that in uh, academic uh, community, of course, we have fantastic organizations that already work on a non-for-profit basis to improve certain aspects of scholarly communication. Uh, ORCID, of course, is a fantastic example, but also Crossref. Uh, you have trade organizations like STM, um, so, on the long term, it might very well be that, that the, the, the organization will be, you know, uh, placed under one of these. Um, again, we don't want to have yet another body. Uh, the good thing about Crosshair, for example, is that like 4,000 publishers are already part of it. So that the governance could be very well uh, fitted there. But again, that's, that's all for the future, but I definitely think that's, that's an avenue we have to explore. Hi, morning. That's a really good presentation. Um, I'm curious about the first thing you talked about where you said there are a lot of papers coming in from China and not enough reviewers. And I didn't really understand how your particular system addresses that problem. Yeah, it's, it's, um, the, it means that we have to stress more on coordination. It means that we have to give the editors the tools uh, to pinpoint the right editors. It means that we have to make sure that reviewers are not inundated with review requests. So again, if we can make it more efficient, if we can give the reviewers the tool to say, uh, I would not s select that reviewer because he's not going to answer because he's doing two other reviews, or hey, look at that reviewer, he's actually new in the field and he, you know, he raises his hand, please let me do a review for the journal, then we can basically make it more efficient and therefore, um, again, decrease the review times. Yeah. Yeah, I think that definitely, and there are efforts on the way. I mean, the publishers are doing that themselves, for example. Again, we cannot solve, that's a very good point to make, blockchain cannot solve all the problems, uh, and are definitely people recognize this. So this is, uh, this is definitely something that is, that is uh, being worked on. It's, we don't see it as our responsibility. We just want to make sure that things are more efficient so that you know, the pressure is, is, is managed in a more efficient way. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Here in the back. Hi. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I just... Uh, I just had lunch, uh, breakfast and I watched the presentation. I had to rush back to comment on that because I watched it in the live stream. And I have to tell you, um, I'm friendly, but this is not blockchain for science. And I would even say that what you're doing doesn't even require a blockchain, right? So it's basically a presentation of an engineering approach to, to the problem of peer review that does not exist. and it's actually quite dystopian, you know, you're throwing around with uh, terms like identity, you showed this uh, example of having this Gryffindor person and then you might even want to tie in his holiday plans. I mean, I think it's great that uh, Cambridge University wants to work with you, but I think that's the reason why then I wouldn't want to work there anymore because it's just terrible, this is not how research works. And I mean, it's just a engineering approach, rather riding on the, on the blockchain hype, okay? but it's not what really blockchain uh, means in the context of knowledge creation. Thank you for your opinion. Um, at, at the end of the day, and I think it came through uh, prior talks, um, where, I mean, if you, as a scientist, you need to use tools. Um, a lot of scientists are happy to build their tools. Others are not interested in building tools. Um, the previous presentation was about taking open source tools and trying to fit them so that um, they could become something useful. This is also what we're trying to do. If you don't find it useful, that's absolutely fine. Um, we believe it serves a purpose. Um, hopefully it will, otherwise someone else will come up with something else. But thanks for your opinion. So I'm here. Thanks, guys, for the presentation. I wanted to ask, uh, address this question, Alex, to you. You mentioned that you, the reason why you're using a private blockchain is because you want to test uh, a lot of things before you go public. Why not use testnet then? Um, one answer, uh, CryptoKitties. Um, basically, 
uh, and maybe, so I have a, a, a corporate background for, uh, for, for a while. I don't like when I'm not able to uh, control a system that uh, allows me to guarantee a certain level of, um, of, um, of usability for the people who use it. The problem with testnet or Ethereum or any public blockchain is that um, because you have this original goal of being open to anyone who wants to use your system, it means that you're also uh, accepting to share resources. And for certain things, it's okay, but um, I believe that if you want to be able to uh, provide a system with any level of granularity, uh, of uh, reliability, you need to have more control on what you have. To give you an example, I am not sure that uh, CERN will allow anyone to use the, um, their, uh, their, their systems, for instance, because they want to come up with their nice physics experiments simply because you need to be able to control what's, uh, the, the systems you use to be able to get to proper measurements. Um, so we could use a testnet, especially at the current stage, because we don't have any scalability issues or anything yet. However, we would be exposed at a later stage to someone coming up with an amazing app such as CryptoKitties that then takes down the network um, and we don't have much to say to the people who use our system. Correct. Though, though, though again, I mean, the Ethereum community is doing an enormous amount of work to be able to scale their blockchain. Uh, personally, uh, as a technologist, uh, I'm much, much more comfortable with the approach that Tendermint takes, um, and I would for now go for that. However, we've kept this compatibility, compatibility layer, which allows us to switch back to Ethereum at one point if we're if we get to the point where we think is better. So there are actually many questions, but um, the, the time for the slot is over. Do we um, allow more questions? Yeah? Okay, cool. So then um, you were? Uh, could you please clarify what are the incentives for scientists to switch to your system uh, in their uh, articles and, and reviewers? Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, actually I think uh, it might very well be the case that scientists don't realize that they're using the blockchain. Because we're not replacing the, the existing systems. We're not replacing submission systems. We're not replacing um, 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 any of the tools they work. The only thing that what we want to do is that the blockchain works in the background so that, again, the selection of the reviewer is better. So the reviewer will just notice uh, the, uh, in the end that he gets more targeted invitations, that he can proactively indicate their interest, that the, and that the authors will realize that the review times become smaller. So again, it's not a system that, that we, we will, um, that the, the researchers themselves will actively work with. It's, uh, again, the publishers and the institutions and things like ORCID will interact with the system. Do you have any um, uh, forms of like appeal or accountability within your system? Why, you know, what's the point of the open peer review and uh, uh, immutable record of it? What's the point of, sorry, open peer review? Yeah, what's the point of the immutable record and the trail of the record if uh, I, I'm asking you do you have any systems of appeal or accountability for yeah. the review process? So if I do a review, and uh, it's biased. What's what's you know how how is your open blockchain immutable record uh, solves the problem of the bias? Um, very good question. If you look at it in a different way, um, so right now um, we're we're building a system and we're opening it up to. Uh, big publishers who have access to a lot of review data. Uh, and, and smaller publishers uh, also. But th the main point there is that we do not build a system that only big publishers can use. Um, we hope that at one point anyone who is, uh, who is custodian of such data can see the data there. Then, because it's an open system, it's a blockchain, it's immutable, it's public, 
We also hope that everyone can decide whether they feel that if they see, for instance, in an ORCID profile, that someone has done a review for a given journal from a given publisher, they may decide that they think, oh, these guys, I hate them, and I don't like what they do, what they write, so I rate them as maybe 10% trustability. That's for everyone to decide. Maybe as an individual, you want sort of only to work with certain uh, publishers who have specific ways of working that you believe in, in which case it's all good. Our system doesn't preclude, preclude you from doing this. On the contrary, it allows you to basically be able to choose what source you want to use. And at the end of the day, maybe in 10, 20 years time, all the big publishers and the small publishers that we can't really know about, maybe they won't be there anymore. Maybe they will. But that's not for us to decide. The market and you guys, as researchers, as scientists, will decide. And if they're still there, then maybe the answer will be, at the end of the day, they do provide some service that is good enough. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's good enough. What we hope is that we provide a way to give choice. That's it. Um, so, yeah. as, as someone who's had a lot of papers rejected, um, one, of the really one of the really frustrating parts of the scientific publishing process is that you go through the review process, your paper gets rejected, and then you start all over again yeah. with a different journal, with yeah. a different publisher. Um, and also, as a reviewer, yeah. what is also really frustrating yeah. is that you review a paper, you give constructive feedback, the paper gets rejected, yeah. And you, you might as well have not given all yeah. that constructive feedback. Yeah. Um, so what would be incredibly useful would be um, a system where the reviews can be passed between yeah. journals uh, and so you're not starting from scratch. And, and, and I, know, I know that some publishers do that like yeah. within their own sort yeah. of suite of journals, but yeah. doing that across would be, would be really cool. Yeah, that's actually, that's actually, we have two slides decks, and that's actually the fourth point on one of the other slide decks, portability. And it's definitely one of the things we're, th we're so recognition, transparency, um, uh, re uh, review coordination, and portability. Indeed, in the case of cascades, that, that you can give permission to one publisher to the other, saying, please take over this uh, review process, uh, and here's access, for example, to the review board, but also in case, for example, the ownership changes of a journal, so that you know, history can come along. So that's definitely on the agenda. All right, we are already running a bit late. Um, thank you very much for this talk. If you have a question, please um, um, catch Alex and Joris in the break. Thank you again. Um.